Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M, 1M, as you know, is the first global virtual accelerator for startups in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue, build a trillion dollars in global GDP and 10 million jobs. We were off for a couple of weeks, so we have missed a couple of Thursday roundtables. But we are back, and uh, this is our 361st session. So starting in the fall of 2008 with a few tinkering experiments, we have come a long way, and uh, we have had, a, had the opportunity to work with so many of you in so many different corners of the world. It's been such an educational experience for us, and I hope you have derive value out of these sessions. If you are live tweeting the show today, please use hashtag 1M1M. Join us on Twitter at 1M by 1M or at Shromana. We publish a lot of interesting content, educational content, inspirational content, informational content through these channels. The 1M1M Roundtables channel on YouTube is where recordings of all these sessions are situated. You will find tons of recordings as well as other video content from the 1M1M program. This is our call-in number. Um, we're quite, not quite ready for call-in yet, but we will be later on in the program. Uh, so make a note, and I will put the slide back when we are ready for call-ins. We're going to start today with Hugh Massey, CEO of DNA Behavior International from Australia. Uh, Hugh, welcome. It's great to have you here. Hugh, please unmute your line so we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Are you there? Yes, we can hear you now. Perfect. So welcome, I'm delighted you. to uh, to be here. Great. Well, let's start by having you tell us what you do. So what we do at DNA Behaviour International is we are a people insights business and we are a technology business that helps businesses and financial advisors know, engage and grow all of their employees and particularly their clients. And the, you know, the business started out as Financial DNA, which is one of our uh, big platforms Still, it's really the biggest platform that we have in our business. And you know, what we do there is, and, and, and what's important about it is that we've been helping financial advisors all over the world not only help their clients determine their goals, but navigate their emotions in the process of achieving their, uh, uh, their goals. And the, you know, the human emotions are the big difference between success and failure, not only in wealth creation, but in, a, in any area of life, and regardless of who you are, whether you've got $1 to your name, whether you've got a billion dollars. Can you give us an example of what kind of heuristics you can you know, pick up and then what is the actionable insight that you give to an advisor who is advising a financial client? Well, the classic one and the, and the most basic one in a way, although none of this is basic, but, but the one that most people know about is uh, risk, people's risk tolerance or the propensity to take risks would be, would, be the, would be the one that most people know about because that's a behaviour and how much risk can you, can you tolerate. But when you, you know, and this is really why I got into designing the financial DNA model, which is getting to the person's whole financial personality. So we're looking at every dimension mm -hmm. of how a person makes financial decisions. And risk, you know, their risk tolerance is really only one aspect of that and, and, and in, in itself is multidimensional. But what we're looking at in terms of, you, if you bring up the heuristics is, for example, uh, people's spending patterns. And, and one of the biggest reasons that people don't achieve their goals is that they're spenders. And actually the spending type people are more, much more emotional and that actually causes more risk in terms of uh, their portfolios and in, and, and, and in their investments because if you spend a lot of money, then you have to make a lot of money to cover that up in terms of uh, maintaining your lifestyle or building your business. But if you broaden that out, uh, 
You know, the other types of heuristics might be, for example, some people follow the herd. They do what everybody else is doing. And that's why markets rise and fall. Uh, there are others that sort of follow a practice of what we call mental accounting. So therefore they segment their, their finances off in, in a whole lot of uh, buckets. And then they get landlocked to those buckets. Oh gee, I must have this amount of money for my kid's education or saving up for my daughter's wedding uh, or, or to buy a second house. And uh, it gets very inflexible in terms of their decision making. Is it wrong? No. Uh, not necessarily, but it can get inflexible. And that's just a mental pattern that people uh, have and they get landlocked. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, and I know we've got entrepreneurs listening on the call today, one that, uh, um, you know, that they get stuck with is the fact that they take a consolidated view of their portfolio. So they're looking at the overall result. Okay, I made 11% last year, but when you analyze it out of 10 deals or 10 investments, one or two were pretty good. Uh, and three or four average, and then there are five or six at the bottom there that are very poor or complete loss makers. And it's easy to justify the result and say, okay, well, I've made money and it's all right, but at the end of the day, why did you make, you know, what I would be bringing up to you is, and I was doing this with uh, a group of uh, multimillionaires uh, just earlier this week, why were you making those bad decisions that led you to losing five times? Are you just throwing money up against the wall and hoping? or are you following a proper due diligence process? And, mm -hmm. you know, it's easy to rationalize losses that way, particularly if you're an entrepreneur, and you'll do the same in your businesses as well, you know, that you'll wipe away a whole lot of bad decisions that were made because you're on a winner in one area. And, 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 I, and I think that's sort of like the flawed bias that, that people have. So there, Shramana, are a few of them. There are a lot more than that. Um, you know, we tend to, in our system, deal with 16 of them that affect different people. And, and, and get people to understand how those biases are negatively influencing their portfolio and then reframe the communication starting okay. from that place so that a person will now start to help solve the problem for themselves. Got it. So that gives us a flavor of the nature of your um, you know, heuristics and so forth. When did you start the company and why did you zero in on this particular idea to build your business on? So I started the company in a more official sense in April 2001, and it was very much at that point uh, from scratch. And you know, when I when, when I say from scratch, it was literally a, a, a clean sheet of paper. Why did I start it? Because about 18 months before that, uh, a friend of mine asked me, "Hugh, what are you truly passionate about?" And I already had a business. You know, I had been a, a, a CPA. So I sort of call myself now a reformed accountant because I deal with human behavior. I, but I had, been, I had been a CPA and then I had started a financial services family office business in Australia. So I was already dealing with a lot of uh, people with reasonable amounts of wealth, that varying degrees from a million to a billion uh, was what I was dealing with. But one day a friend of mine said, you know, Hugh, I don't know that you're really happy in what you're doing and what would fulfill you, what would be your passion? And I just jumped out of my mouth I want to help people all over the world become more financially self-empowered. That made me jump. It made me go onto an inner journey to look at what did that really mean? And being mm -hmm. a business person, how would I commercialize that? That's just too powerful to run away. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is, you know, if I'm going to help people be financially self-empowered, it's actually teaching them about themselves, how to make better mm -hmm. decisions. And, you know, I looked at my day journal, there was a whole lot of information in there that I had been noting down about client behavior um, um, and uh, entrepreneur behavior and whatnot for, for quite a long time. And I realized then that, uh, you know, what I was seeing with people was they would say one thing to me in a meeting and they'd behave a different way, unfulfilled talents that, you know, most people were thinking, well, I'm going to make most of my money in life out of investments, but actually they make it from using their talents. So, what I realized is that I had to pull together a program that I could take worldwide and, you know, that, that was what was going to fulfill me. It was very hard to, in a way, move away from the hard, harder side or the hard edge side of dealing with money and transactional side to the soft side. But mm -hmm. I realized that could be made up if I built systems to deal with this and I could go and educate lots of people around the world about who they are and how they deal with money. So that's, that's how it, 
that, that's the genesis Sramana of the idea. So it's been a very, uh, if you want to call it purpose-based business. And then I've tried to be robust about it in terms of putting together processes, systems, and, and obviously a technology platform. Um, so talk and I about the next how part you, is, Talk about how you got the business off the ground at the very beginning. After you crystallized the idea on what you were going to build, how did you get it off the ground? So I got it off the ground, and, 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 and my business was completely self-funded. So I pulled out the huge checkbook. I never wanted to have an outside investor. I've been an outside investor in other people's businesses and I and I know how I probably interfered in their journey a little bit, but I wanted no interference with this. And I felt like if this is a, if this is really good, I should be doing it for myself, you know, financially to start with. And so what happened was I you know, a key point here is I met two very key people in my life who are still on my team um sixteen years later. A uh, lady uh, by the name of Carol Pocklington and a, and a gentleman who who she is still in Australia, and a gentleman in, the, in in America by the name of Lee Ellis, who coached and educated me that my theories about human behaviour were correct, and they helped me validate a system. And once we got the mm -hmm. algorithms right, then I then I started investing in the technology, not only to discover the behaviour but also how to apply it, so that it would be meaningful in building the financial plan. And once we got to that level, I then started using it with the clients that I had in Australia. And then I just got up at four o'clock in the morning. Uh, you know, this was sort of like a year into having used the system a lot with clients. So we knew it worked. It was validated scientifically. Uh, and we continued to do that. But I just got up at four o'clock in the morning and relentlessly called people in the United States and said, I've got this system, this idea. It's going to transform how you do financial planning. Uh, you can't do a financial plan if you don't know who the client is and rah, 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 I went on with it and I just you did that every morning. You were financial advisors at banks? At banks, uh, independent financial advisors. I just uh, yeah. would go and research who was an influencer in the industry and I would call them up and badger them uh, until they uh, returned my phone call. I somehow uh, worked out how to get um, presentation slots at, at some uh, major conferences like the Financial Planning mm -hmm. Association, NAPFA, other industry groups uh, that, would, that would have me come along and speak about this idea called financial DNA because the name is quite catchy. People don't forget it. And that's sort of how it went. And, you know, one person then said, you know, Hugh, I want you to come and talk to my team about this. And, and they might want to use it. A guy called Jim Barnash in Chicago, and I just got on that aeroplane from Sydney, and I had no other meetings in America, and went and saw it. And you know, from there it went from scratch. But he was an industry influencer. Uh, we connected well, and you know, I just started doing that. And then it really came down to where do I live, and that's when I decided to live in the United States because I, I just couldn't get up at four o'clock. Although I do get up early every day here getting up at four in the morning, going in the cold to the, to the office, making phone calls. You know, you have to do it, but it's a hard life, and I thought I'd be better to be in the t same time zone and around these people day in, day out. So your customer base are financial advisors, big <laughs> and small, uh, yeah. and, and you sell them what? You sell them in a software as a service mode? What is the business model? What is the delivery mo model of your technology? Yeah, and, 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 and today, as opposed to when we started, you know, when we started it was like a per person model, pay us a fee, buy it online, and it was like a per client click uh, online. Um, today it's a software as a service model, SaaS model. We sell an annual subscription to each advisor or to their firm, and they pay us an annual fee or they can pay it monthly, and they can use it as much as they like. Uh, we have various packages and um, uh, you know, that they can buy because we've got a number of tools in the system. So it's really a matter of how much do they, depth do they want to have, uh, how much uh, training do they want to have and support. And, uh, you know, we've sort of set that up with quite a lot of behavioral science in terms of knowing which ones they're more likely to buy depending on how they run their business and what they're trying to achieve with their clients. Mm -hmm. So uh, you you have bootstrapped to ten million dollar plus from Australia. Of course, you have kind of lived in the U.S. to interface with your U.S. clients, but your your home base is still Australia in terms of the organization. Yes. No, the home base of the organization actually now is the United States. Um, but you, so when I'm, you started I'm, off, it was still in Australia, isn't it? Yeah. 
I, so I moved it across from Australia to the United States uh, some years ago, uh, around uh, 2009 or 10. I, I, I did okay. that. Um, right. But, uh, so but we, I was living in the US then. Your, can we walk through your journey a little bit? Um, how long did it take you to get to a million dollars in revenue, annual revenue? You started in 2001. We were, yeah, 2001, um, you know, was, was zero. I was really using it with clients already, so yeah. they, we weren't really making any money out of it for the first couple of years because I was just road testing it with, with clients. It wasn't until mm -hmm. 2004 when I started going to the United States that what I call genuine money came in for the business um, itself because we'd had a long research period. Um, and, you know, we had some system shifts along the way. So, you know, the first million came in in, 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 in 2007, and then we've just grown it up uh, ever since. And it's on, a, it's on a lot faster track now because we're getting more enterprise clients in the last two or three years. So we, we yeah. sort of muddled around at two and three million for quite a while. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and a lot of it was just getting the systems right, making it easier for people to use. And also, Shramana developing the scalability. You know, we've just signed up a, a firm yeah. that's got three and a half thousand advisors. And, you know, that's just about to start. In fact, we signed that contract on Monday. And, you know, that will have a multiplication impact in its own, in its own right. And there are others of those that are coming this year. So, um, you know, the growth path is probably more to the hockey stick level now. It did take a long time to happen. Okay. And I think that's, that's in part because, you know, we are still a way, in a way ahead of the game or the market in the, in the type of product we have. Firms are really only just getting to the human behavioral aspects now. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas when I started, uh, you know, it was even very hard to explain what we did because I got a lot of glazed eyes. But I always knew this was right. And it was a matter of being very patient, and determined, and, uh, you know, and, and in a way waiting for the market. So um, let me get a little bit of the journey. So two to three million while you were still, still doing this from Australia, but selling to U.S. clients, uh, you know, from Australia and by traveling. And then around 2009, when you moved the center of gravity of the business to the United States, uh, what kind of revenue level were you at? We were still, we were still in, that, in that level there. And, level. you know, I had already been, you know, I was spending a lot of my time in the United States, really from 2004 onwards, I bought a home here. But mm -hmm. <laughs> that's when, the, you know, the legal transition of the business started to take place there in, in 2010, um, you know, what in terms of sort of the more illegal. What have been the key strategic moves that have been instrumental in making, making your business go from that two to three million? It sounds like a bit of a plateau phase to then, you know, shift gears to 10 million plus, and then now you're shifting gears again to a, a faster curve. Uh, what, what are you seeing? What were your key strategic moves that were the inflection points of the business? The, the, the key strategic moves were, were moving the business away from being a lot more of a, what I call a coaching model where it was requiring yeah. heavier training and facilitation to moving it much more as an online, if you want to call it digital type model, where uh, it was self, a lot more self-contained within the technology. So we were delivering a lot, you know, a lot of the a lot of the insights that we have uh, were getting delivered far more online in a much more user-friendly format. So, you know, today when an advisor signs up for our program, they basically get it straight away and they can work with it straight away. Um, they may have 30 minutes of support, whereas at the start they were requiring to come to along to a couple of two-day training programs uh, mm -hmm. to learn how to do it. Now, we, we still run the training programs, but they're at a much higher level, deeper level. We've got one going on in our office today. Uh, mm -hmm. But we've been able to get a lot more people to the table more quickly. We've done a lot more trainer-trainer inside some of the larger organisations. But I would say it's the heavy investment in technology that's been important in, in, in building a scalable system. Like we've got a integration with Salesforce.com, so that gets mm -hmm. us a lot of 
a visibility. A client or an advisor can just open up their Salesforce account and bam, they can see the insights that are completed by their client and it's all integrated in one spot ready for them to, to work with their clients. So it's really building, you know, at the end of the day, be building strategic relationships like that help us grow. That also is what leads us to the enterprise because the enterprise firms, the larger firms, a lot of them are using groups like Salesforce and there are other ones like InvestNet, which may not mean much to, to too many people outside the US in the industry, but you know, there are bigger technology platforms that once you start integrating to them, your name in a way travels with them. We still have to sell our product, but mm -hmm. everybody wants everything accessible in, in nanoseconds all in one place, single sign on password. And to do that though, you have to actually have to have a very, at a deep level, you have to have a very robust technology system. So I've had to invest all the way along very heavily in the technology to enable us to get to that, to that scalable place. Mm -hmm. So that was and one of the key things that you needed to be able to operate at a higher clip. That's right. And, and now, you know, if you, say, if you take it where, where, where to next with this is, again, it's the continual digitalization of uh, financial planning, for example. But there are a whole, you know, the robo-advisor is growing. I don't know whether a pure robotic model completely works, but having more robotic platform inside a human-based uh, service platform definitely works. And there's a lot more scope for us uh, in that. But we've also mm -hmm. found um, other areas where we're able to do integrations and add a lot of value. For example, we're working, started to work with a video company where we're customizing the videos to, to personality style so that the client feedbacks can be done, customized to style using video technology. So there are a lot of, you know, when you, when you think outside the box, there are a lot of ways to, uh, you know, to, to build those touch points to either sustain your revenue, add value, or frankly, just to get new clients from that visibility. So you are, at this point, you're over 10 million in revenue and you're still fully bootstrapped? Still fully bootstrapped. I haven't taken on an outside investor at any level. Uh, whether I do or not, I think, uh, you know, that could come down, that could come later uh, when, when we're a much more, uh, you know, a, a larger business, but I would only ever want to have one. And I, and I think if they were to come on board, they would have to be a gateway to a whole lot of clients. I don't want just somebody's money for the sake of having it. Uh, I, I would, I would, they would have to be a gateway to clients. And, you know, and I think in, in a way that's got to lead to, a, you know, a much more scaled up result for them as well. Um, you know, we are doing some deals with large organizations and it's very possible one of them would want to buy us or we would do cut some deal with them because they can get us in front of, frankly, hundreds of financial services firms and millions of clients. And that's probably where it's going to happen through some kind of strategic play. Yeah, okay, very good. You know, uh, for the audience, I want to underscore something in Hugh's journey that is something that you should take note of. Often, when you start building a product, and a business in an area where you may be quite a bit ahead of the market, the market's thinking and your thinking are not timeline-wise synced up. That is a phase where you're much better off bootstrapping for a while until you and the market sync up. And, and if you don't bootstrap and if you try to bring financing into that phase where you are in the market and not synced up, you're going to grow at a very, very slow pace. And at some level, from a venture capitalist viewpoint, Hugh's journey is a, from 2001 to 2009 and in, in two to three million dollars revenue uh, view, uh, you know, level is a slow journey and venture capitalists don't have appetite for that. However, if you're bootstrapping, it's okay. You, it gives you runway to experiment and to tinker, to experiment with the market, to understand the market, get the market feedback and work that into your technology and your product and your strategy, and then kind of position yourself for 
for higher inflection point growth. And that is perfectly okay. This is the, the trajectory of this business, as you can see, is a longer horizon, a longer timeline. But, and, and the first, you know, several years of this journey are at a slower clip, and then it accelerates, and then possibly it could accelerate even further. But my point is, if you do not manage whom you bring into your journey at what point, there's a very strong likelihood that you're gonna go out of business. And Hugh told you right up front that he chose not to take outside investment, and if he had made a different choice, if he had made the choice to take venture capital early on in the journey, this business would have been dead by now because the investors would pull the plug. So this is a lesson that you need to internalize very seriously. There is a tremendously unhealthy behavior in our industry where every entrepreneur immediately after deciding to become an entrepreneur chases investors right away. And that could not be a worse way of looking at entrepreneurship. So this is why I wanted to highlight Hugh's journey for you, hear it from him, how he has navigated, what have been the nuances of the business and how his extremely wise decision making has allowed him to get to this point where we, he does have a robust business, does have a you know very healthy, profitable business and, and significant size business. So Hugh, would you like to add to what I said? Well, I, I thank you for saying that, Stramana, and you know, I was interviewed the other day by someone who said, you know, you're a very steady player and I'm and I'm not your uh you know, your flashy operator. And but I think that, you know, to, to add to your points there that the way I've looked at this as well is that you've always got to be in business and viable to take take advantage of opportunities when they come. One second. Uh, Maureen, somebody is Okay, so, so you always have to be in business and viable to take advantage of opportunities as they come. And there's no such thing as an overnight success, although people will look at you as that because they start hearing about the story. But I think in terms of the venture capitalist as well, that, you know, and I look at it in my own case study, I may end up having a venture capitalist or an outside financier for one specific product that we spin off out of the business using the, the platforms and the insights and we rebrand it in some way. So there are always a lot of ways to skin the cat to deal with the fast growth element when, it, when, it, when, when that opportunity uh, comes along. But if you're not in business, you can't take advantage of the opportunity. And I think that and, and you know, you there's also said, a lot of patience. What you just said is the vital point. You have to survive to succeed. If you die, yep. you don't get a chance to play. And that is not the way to play this game. That's right, that's right. Um, the only other thing I'd like to say on the call, if, if we're near the end of it, um, you know, to offer, and I know, Stramani, you're dealing with a lot of entrepreneurs, we're doing a big entrepreneurial study at the moment of, of the behavior of entrepreneurs and how you, you know, what, what are the, uh, what's the wiring of a successful entrepreneur that builds a sustainable business that, that, that does go over a million dollars. And we've got a link, in fact, we have another business unit called Business DNA um, and, you know, if, if anyone wants to go on to businessdna.com and complete a, a business DNA assessment, we, we can provide you with insights as to, you know, what your strengths and struggles for an entrepreneur are going to be because, you know, making wise decisions is important, um, you know, being passionate about your product, but you also, I think the, the wiring, uh, you know, how you're wired up as a human being is important and knowing how to manage yourself emotionally on the journey is equally as important. Yeah. All right. Very good, Hugh. Thank you for coming, and and uh, I know you have to run. We're going to switch to the rest of the presentation, but it's it's Thank great to be able to showcase your your story. Thank you, Samara. I, I really appreciate it, and uh, thanks for bringing your message to the world. All right, folks. We're going to switch to the entrepreneur pitch session. Um, let me give you a few points before we start the pitches. Today we have an absolutely full schedule, so you're going to need to really stay on time. Maureen has briefed you about what kind of time you have. You need to follow those instructions. 
Um, one thing you must understand is that we are here to help you. We are completely on your side. There is no other agenda. This is a safe place for you to discuss your issues. And um, that's really why we are here is to help you accelerate your journey a bit. And that's about all there is to our agenda. It is possible that you may disagree with my feedback. That's okay. It's your venture. You will make the strategic decisions and the strategic calls. Um, so it really, you can take the feedback that you get here and do whatever you like with it. There's one thing that you need to remember, not all businesses can raise money. Not all businesses should raise money. And raising money doesn't guarantee success. Um, we are also, uh, you know, the other thing that I wanted to tell you is that uh, we have you know, just about 10 minutes today for each entrepreneur to present. Um, what is the situation with Ali's line? Can, can he do this presentation without echoing? Ali? Uh, hello, Sabana. Yeah, I'm online, Sabana. All hello. right, good. Can you hear me? Welcome. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. You get to start up okay. today's presentation so go ahead okay so okay my name is Ali Tariq and few months back I along with my brother Bilal founded a GMAX web company called Febista as I emailed you about my background and how we got started few days back yeah okay okay yeah Febista our company focuses focus on sentence correction type questions or GMAX verbal section and aims helping GMAT takers attain 100% accuracy in each SC type question, sentence correction type question, and that to expanding less than 30 seconds in each of these questions, so that more time can be spared for reading comprehension type questions, for which more amounts to more accuracy and critical reasoning type questions. This is our value proposition. So your target audience is a set of GMAT takers who are possibly operating with a non-English as a first language kind of background. Exactly. Yes. non english GMAT These tests, there is strong mathematical skills, but they lag in the verbal section and primarily in the sentence correction type of questions. There are three type of questions in verbal section. Sentence correction type questions, reading comprehension type questions, and critical reasoning type questions. Okay. On sentence correction type of question. So where are you now? Own... What is the what is the current status? Okay. The current status is we are very active on the forum called Beat the GMAT, and for the past four to five months, we are actively answering the queries of students there, okay. and we are kind of building the credibility, the trust, the authority. And we are, we, we are able to get the expert status in Beat the GMAT in six months. Okay. In six months of the, our time standing there. This is the current status. We are active there. And we are, we are planning to prepare our proprietary health connection type questions. So right now, you do not have proprietary content to Offer to people who are engaging. So hold on, Ali, don't talk okay. over me. If you if you talk and I talk all together, nobody gets to hear okay. anything, and you okay. don't get to hear me. Yeah. I don't get to hear you. So this is the you know cardinal okay. rule of participating in a forum like this is that you have to talk in sequence and not talk over each other. So, um, okay. so my question is, is right now the people that you are engaging with at this BTG forum. What is their yeah. call to action? Are you able to bring them to your site and upsell additional content to them, or you don't have you don't have that in place yet? The second piece of this puzzle. Okay, we are establishing the authority because the students they don't they don't they don't they don't get the tutors they don't from the tutors unless and until they are experts. So we are 
establishing our authority, our expertise. We are working on this at the moment. Okay. Okay. But, but what is the end game? Right now, you're just you're participating in this BDG forum and establish, establishing credibility. But what is the conversion path into your monetization? You're gonna, you know, I uh, over the email exchange that we had a couple of days ago, I told you to go check out the Magush case study. We have an interview in one of these roundtables with yeah. the founder of Magush, and we also have an interview. Uh, a, a you yeah. know text interview which is much longer on this case yeah. study. So as you know from that case study that the way to do this is you engage with people in the forums, but then you also need a repository of content and so forth to engage with and event eventually turn these people into subscribers. Where are you yeah, in that exactly. continuum and what is the strategy okay. thereof? thereof? Okay. I went to the Magoos case study and what I got from there that Blog, blog, blog writing work for them. We plan to opt short videos, blogs, and a proprietary forum. In proprietary forum around our product. Building community around your, our product. What is your timeline this for generating a critical mass of content? Okay, as I emailed you that we, as of now, we are little confused from where to start. We don't know because we were going to, through the YC videos. They were very, they were of the opinion that the one of the founders must be a coder. If you have to build a product that is a forum community, forum like online community, one, one of the founder, we are two founders at the moment. One of the founder must be a technical person. As of now, in parallel, I am, I'm, getting acquainted with a little bit of coding and as of now i am also writing a little bit of content in the parallel and we are we are learning the seo strategies as well so we don't I have see. any so you you don't know really how to put together a content portal that's what you're saying you're you you know that you need to put together a content portal. You know you need to develop content and you need to manage the technical infrastructure of that. And you're saying that you do not know how to do any of that. Yeah, we, I, none of us. We are not technical founders, so we don't know how to code. We are. I am specifically as of now and learning a little bit of coding. I am developing okay. in how. So that's not going to be sufficient. Content. That's not going to be sufficient. You're going to have to do one of two things. Either you get a third co-founder who does have coding experience and can can do all this technical work, or you can outsource. You know, this is not hugely complicated. Uh, in terms of development work, it's not hugely complicated. So you could also outsource, but then, of course, that's going to require a little bit of investment. So do you have resources to invest in getting software developed outsourced? We have $10,000 as of now from our own money. We have our own money of $10,000. Okay, well then you need to save that money and first and foremost decide on what is the spec that you need to develop. So what I would like you to do next as a homework, and, and you can come talk to me at the next private roundtable, which is on, you know, coming up, or or the next public roundtable, whatever. We'll figure out what when you're ready, depending on when you're ready, we can talk more. But what you need to do is try to come up with the spec of what is it that you're gonna develop, both technically and content-wise, and and then come discuss that with me, and then we need to find a strategy of how you're going to get that developed and what is it going to cost you. So these are the two next okay, steps okay. we need to track. And I will dialogue okay, with great. you by email as well on these. Okay, great. I do that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank All right, you. folks, by the way, Ali is a premium member of the 1M1M program, so uh, she do he does get a bit of privileged treatment. Um, because of his, you know, status in the program. Um, Rajan Sharma is next.
express yes. this self. Rajan, please go ahead. Yeah, you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, so, we have this uh, platform for B2B uh, marketplace, uh, which is mm -hmm. called uh, Access to Sell. And uh, what we are doing here is we are giving a platform to uh, uh, business ecosystem which has uh, excess inventory or uh, aging inventory, which they need to liquidate. Uh, the only okay. difference, the differentiator, the differentiator which we have, I mean, uh, this is India's uh, first which is completely focusing on the uh, aging inventory and uh, excess stock liquidation across uh, groups and uh, verticals. Uh, the market is uh, very huge. We expect that all across uh, electronics and mobility and home furnishing, uh, and if we go to apparels and if you go to IT, telecom, mobility, uh, the floating inventory which, which is uh, expected is almost about 20%, uh, which goes to almost about uh, US dollar 30 billion uh, kind of uh, opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. Fortunately, nobody has been able to uh, uh, target this uh, particular problem. I mean, there have been uh, places like, uh, I mean, sorry, platforms like or marketplaces like who do refurbish or who do uh, returns, etc. But nobody is uh, clearly focusing as a core business on uh, excess inventory. So this is where uh, we saw this opportunity. And uh, what we have a uh, unique uh, uh, method of uh, uh, at the back end, what we have developed is that we give a confidential, anonymous, and uh, neutral platform to the buyers. I mean, uh, the idea was that uh, when somebody has excess inventory, it, it may be a result of a bad sale or a bad decision, and they don't want to publicize to their peers or their existing customers that, you know, I'm stuck with my stock or it was a bad decision. So we, our platform gives them opportunity where they can sell off or dispose of their but inventory in a very con that That same phenomenon will exist on the platform as well, right? If you have a vendor who's selling excess inventory, it's, it is going to be their customers who are going to be the likely buyers of that. How do you how do you address that issue that they don't want to give that signal to their customers? Uh, yes. So what we do is uh, we, as a platform, we buy from the sellers and we sell to the buyers. So in between the platform, uh, platform works as a neutral place. I mean, it's not that, you know, the seller knows who is buying and the buyer knows who is uh, selling to him. So we as a platform come in between and ensure that the confidentiality is maintained. I see. So does that mean that you're going yes. to have to buy inventory or are these people going to give you this product on consignment? No, we buy inventory, but our model is based on the based on the premise that we brought, we have uh, sellers who have their own dashboards, so they upload the inventories, they upload the pricing, they upload the MOQ, and then we broadcast this message to our uh, B2B partner database. And then once somebody confirms that, yes, <coughs> yes, he is interested in this and he is ready to buy this, then the whole procurement starts. So the business model works on a no inventory basis. Okay, got it. So you don't have to finance inventory. That's good. And and you take no, what ten percent no. of the of the proceeds? We have uh, categories where group wise um, fees, transaction fees in percentages. So it starts from two point five percent to up to ten percent, depending on okay. like apparels and home and kitchen appliances would be. Uh, definitely more than uh, the IT products or uh, telecom or mobility products. Uh, we did and a, do you have, is this a platform already operational? Do you, is this an operating business or is it a concept stage business? No, we are operating since uh, uh, we started this uh, platform, uh, launched it in uh, last year, I mean, uh, and we have been uh, bootstrapping our business. Uh, the okay. commercial transactions we started uh, last year, uh, uh, September 2016, and uh, mm -hmm. we have slowly been, uh, once the MVP was ready and we, uh, we saw that uh, it is possible to uh, execute. So now we have started adding the new categories and that is where we are looking at uh, strategic resources or, you know, uh, looking at raising some capital where we have the resources to go out and uh, tie up with all, all the sellers and uh, buyers, etc., and the, acquire the businesses so that they come on board with the new products and all. So, what, so do you have any, 
anchor uh, sellers right now? Do you have in access to inventory at the moment in any category? Yes, yes. We, oh, yes, yes. We started because our backgrounds are from uh, IT. I mean, uh, I was uh, working with Gigabyte Taiwan and uh, have been working with Foxconn and uh, Pegatron and Taiwan vendors. We have our own, uh, I mean, my last tenure was with the uh, Dealing India combined uh, companies where we were making motherboards for uh, desktops. So have been working with a lot of uh, OEMs and ODMs and local brands in India. And uh, we have uh, companies like Acer, companies like Lenovo, companies like Dealing. Uh, we have uh, companies like uh, local uh, Lava smartphone company, which is uh, uh, giving us uh, stocks to liquidate. Yes. Okay. And and are, so have you started transacting? Have you got some portion of this buyer seller? Yes. Uh, market yes. validated, yeah. And yes. And what, what level of transactions? We, we have uh, since uh, last year September. We have done about uh, uh, about 100k US dollar 100k transactions up to now. So that and is the value of the transaction. Yes. Okay. And um, got it. So I get an idea about where you are business wise. Yes. And what does this mean? 2100 onboarded? What is that? Uh, these are these are the buyers and sellers which we have done onboarding. I mean, this is the business acquisition with all their uh, documents and their uh, details which are available to us so that they can transact uh, uh, on our platform. And industry data in hand means we have the database where we need to go out and acquire them. Maybe there's some offline or online activities required wherever uh, we need to go and approach them and say that, yes, please uh, come on board and uh, be a seller or a buyer on our platform. Okay. So, uh, you know, it sounds interesting. You're, I'll just start off by answering your question. Do you fall in the 0.1% business which can raise funds? Maybe. I don't know yet. Because the thing that we need to sort out, if you have, were to take this pitch to an investor, the investor is going to need more information to be able to make that decision. And I, you know, I'm right. right now I'm going to give you that same perspective. I'll role play with you as an investor that the thing that I'm looking for here is to figure out what is the lever of growth and acceleration. So you've gone from zero to 100K in about 10 months, maybe, something like that. Yes, less right? than 10 months. Less than 10 months. Yes. Less than yes. 10 months. But I, I need to understand what is going to start. And you've got a whole bunch of, you've seeded the platform. You've got a whole bunch of players now on the platform ready to transact. Some have transacted a little bit. Are we looking at right. an acceleration point right now? And, and what I would le need to kind of double click down and understand what are the dynamics to get your. Um, you know, players, the marketplace players to transact more actively such that the volume of business really goes to an inflection point. Because remember, as I say always, and you, if, you, if you've been following my work, you know that VCs are trying to go from zero to $100 million in five to seven years. So is this in that 0.1% of the businesses that falls in that category? That is the question that we're going to need to answer in the investor pitch right. that you're going to be developing. Right. I'll be happy to help you okay. figure out how to yes. build that investor pitch and you know how to frame your business in that mode. So that's you know right now, based on what you've presented here, I can't answer this question. However, I can help you figure out how to answer this question for you and for the investors. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah. All right. Elna Sarabchian. Did I say that right? Yeah, I. Hello, Elna. No? Hi. Uh, Amina, this is Pooja here. I was told Elnaz has not joined in today, so I think it's going to be me next. Okay, so Elnaz is going to be. Not pitching, it seems. Let's go to Pooja. Ah, here we go. Pooja, you're on next then. Thank you. I think th there's a slight mistake in the order of my slides, but I'll try to get you through it. <laughs> okay, so I'm the founder of Begin to Heal. Uh, can we go to the next slide? 
Um, it's a Begin to Heal is going to be an online marketplace for holistic healing where people can come in and book sessions with the top curated practitioners in the country. So my goal is essentially to empower customers with the tools and the practitioners that they need to heal themselves, to establish myself as a premier brand, and also to help practitioners get a platform where they can market themselves. Yeah. Um, if, if you can go to the next one. Um, so essentially, the, the, you know, the gap is today when customers suffer from the side effects of Western medicine or, um, you know, they don't know what are other natural ways to heal themselves. So while there is a zop doc for the Western medicine practitioners, there's no zop doc to the holistic healing world, and that's what I'm trying to be. Um, also, there's a huge gap from uh, the practitioner's perspective where they don't know, they're very good at what they do, but they don't necessarily know how to attract new clients, except okay. for yeah. word of mouth. So there is a clear gap. I want to bridge that gap for both the practitioners and the customers um, at the same time. Um, so if you can hit next. So you are doing a marketplace business model, Puja? Yes, it's a marketplace business model. And unfortunately, I put my offering as the last slide in here. I don't know why I did that. But essentially, what I'm going to have is uh, 250 practitioners with whom you can do sessions on video and in person. I'm going to mm -hmm. have 100 online courses for self-study, 100 guided meditations. Uh, we are going to have daily webinars on the site and uh, selling seats for workshops, retreats, and events that the practitioners have. So I'm not developing any of this. I'm just a marketplace and people and practitioners will post for this to sell. So it's a beautiful, it's a visual delight. Um, I've hired the top SEO company of New York City for this, the top social media company, the top digital marketing agencies. The site itself is really beautiful. I plan to launch on October 1st. And I've already signed How up. are you paying these agencies? Uh, out of my savings. <laughs> so I'm the, I'm the only investor in the business right now. So my background, I used to uh, be uh, heading strategy for Latin America for American Express uh, for eight years. Before that, I was with Microsoft, Pepsi, IBM after business school. So I spent 14 years leading strategy and uh, also business development roles for these companies. And I quit this uh, Early, I quit Amex early last year to build this business out. Mm -hmm. um, so, so point of caution, Pooja, yeah. do not burn all your cash on agencies. Agencies can be extremely expensive. No, and I know. it's not I, a good I, idea to burn all your yeah. cash on agencies without validating your business model, whether it works and how it works and all that. And and, and then you have to also figure out the monetization of this. So. Yeah. You know, a marketplace typically is a you, – what you start, what, the reason I'm bringing this up is that the way you pitched it, it sounded like a – kind of like a mishmash between a content site and a marketplace. And those are two entirely different business models. Yeah, so actually it is a little bit of a mishmash because, you know, currently customers – People who are suffering, for instance, my practices are going to be, so if you can move ahead from marketing, I actually don't know why this order is this way, but um, sorry, this is just membership reward points that they're going to earn in different statuses. But um, So I'm essentially going to market to the New York City base of customers. New York and Los Angeles are the two biggest markets that spend on this, and then I'm going to go across the country and hopefully can take it global. And I have 10 practices that I'm going to be, uh, working with, um, if you can hit next, hopefully that's the practice slide. Mm. Did we skip over it? Uh, sorry. Um, sorry, but the practices essentially that I'm going to have is, are going to be acupuncture, Reiki, hypnotherapy, uh, life coaching, Ayurveda, naturopathy, homeopathy, spiritual coaching, uh, nutrition and health coaching, integrative medicine, um, and personal training. So those are my 10 practice areas, out of which eight practices can be done through video calling. So I have signed up practitioners from all of the country, but I'm starting to market, at least use my dollars only for New York City. I wanted to get one city right before I go forward. So my revenue model on the marketplace is essentially I'm taking between 10 and 15%, either 10% or 15% per session that's booked. Um, on uh, the online courses and guided meditations, it's a 50-50% split. 
And on the webinars, I'm taking 25%, and same on workshops and retreats, I'm taking 25%. So I've already signed and, up. And the platform is built on which you are you're going to be doing this? Yeah, so I mean, while of course it's built on Amazon Web Services, my development team is building it. It's a beta site which is ready. In two weeks, my platform is going to be completely ready and opened up to practitioners to upload everything um, and for me to launch on October 1st. So October 1st is my soft launch. I get the kinks out of the system. And January 1st is when I want to do a big launch. And uh, I'm trying to get uh, uh, you know known speakers and have a beautiful event in New York City to launch. So. I'm valuing the company at $3 million currently. Um, whether I've used discounted cash flows or revenue multiples, whatever method I use, the number five is $3 million, but I'm, I'm, I'm being conservative in there, and I'm hoping to be able to raise at least 10% equity for it. And the money is essentially going to be used for those things which you're seeing on this slide out here. Pooja, the world that I operate in, this business right now is not fundable by professional investors. The only way you can fund this business is through friends, friends and family. So be aware of that. And uh, if you're placing all your bets and burning all your cash on agencies and stuff and with the expectation that you're going to be able to finance this company anytime soon, I think it would be an unwise move because you're going to need to prove out all these assumptions that people are buying. You know, the problem with the Internet today is that it's full of free riders. And you're making certain assumptions that, that consumers are going to pay for what you're offering, and you're going to need to show that there is you know, revenue and there is monetization happening, that there is a lot of expectation among consumers that content is going to be free. And you would be amazed at how difficult it is to extract money out of consumers for content and even the kind of coaching you're talking about. So I'm, I'm you know, assuming that you are right and that you would be able to prove that, but until you prove that, please do not expect that any professional investor I, I agree with is you going to invest in this. I'm not expecting. Actually, I do. I, I am free revenue right now, so I certainly don't expect it. I expect to be start. I expect to start making money first, earning revenue, and then being able to go out there in the market uh, to raise money. Which is uh, why I'm not actively uh, pursuing investors in a big way. I did speak to a bunch, and they all said we love the idea. When you launch, if it's successful, you know, six months in, eight months in, come back and ch chat with us. You know, there are one or two people that I've spoken to, but. I Why are you presenting the slide at this forum? Um, I want to get your sense of if you think that my valuation is reasonable. And uh, this right now, the value right now where you are, the valuation is not reasonable at all because there's nothing in the company yet. There's no validation of your assumptions at all. So this right now. I would say you you do not have a three million dollar valuation by any stretch of imagination. Okay, so let's focus on where I do need help and to think through. Um, number okay. one, I am not burning a lot of uh, uh, things in the uh, – I'm definitely bootstrapping. I have a okay. network. I'm leveraging a network in agencies to whom I've given business through Pepsi and Amex for years who are just helping me okay. at this point. So I'm getting okay. everything for action, and I said I'd say at 10% of the cost. So I'm – I'm one of the most resourceful people I know, so I would definitely not burn hard-earned money away. Um, but so, so the other thing is, my question is, predominantly on the marketplace, is how do I stop, um, and this is a strategic question for my business when I need help, is how do I stop leakages from my platform? That's going to be my big challenge, where people come in, find practitioners, and decide not to go and book directly with them. So I have put in a few guardrails. Guardrail number one is the practitioner contract tells them there's a $1,000 penalty for each breach. Guardrail number two is I've got membership reward points and free sessions that they accumulate. Um, and, you know, these sessions cost anywhere between $150 to $300 a session with the practitioner. And, um, uh, uh, yeah, number three is referral points, where I'm giving them very uh, large number of referral points each time they suggest somebody to the platform. But is so that here's the... The bottom line about marketplaces, Pooja, is that there is leakage, and it's a fact of life for all marketplaces. You can't prevent you know, leakage entirely. 
However, there are also reasons why people choose to stay in marketplaces. So for example, these practitioners that you're talking about, you mentioned upfront quite rightly that these people are good at what they do, which is healing and, and you know, their actual expertise, but marketing is not one of their expertise. So if this is the primary marketing channel through which they're going to be accessing clients, it is in their interest to build up their credibility with reviews and ratings and and so forth within the you know framework of that marketplace. So, so you need to think about strategic ways in which they are staying on the platform and accumulating um, you know the, the credibility essentially is helpful. So if you just to give you a parallel, if you look at Upwork for instance. One thing that uh, vendors, you know, the service providers who are seeking clients on Upwork, one thing they do is uh, Upwork reports on how much business has this person done, how many hours of business, how many hours, uh, you know, how much billing, etc., which gives the people who are hiring from that network a th an indication of the longevity and the credibility and the uh, you know, durability of this particular provider. You can create mechanics like that which basically signals to the providers that if you accumulate these points, it's a bit of a gamification technique actually, if you build up on these points, then that is one way to incentivize them to stay and do their transactions on the site instead of taking it offline. Some people will still take it offline, but I you, think you not all will take and, it offline. Do you mean those ratings and reviews? Is that what you meant? Rating and reviews, and also I'm specifically talking about if you go study Upwork, it actually reports, you know, there's a, there, you know, you, if you were looking for, let's say you're searching for a vendor for a particular expertise, it will ask you, are you looking for people who have been on Upwork and, and for, has done right. 100 hours worth of work or, you know, 1,000 hours worth of work. So that's, that's a benchmark on which people are searching providers. Right, right, right. No, and the, I have the same thing where practitioners are earning points for the ratings that they're getting and for how long they've been on the platform, which puts them organically higher on the search also on the filter compared to others. And how many hours of coaching have they done? Mm. Mm. The, the low-hanging fruit in your case is how to report on and to make it searchable on how many hours of coaching have they done on your platform. And that That's gives right. people the incentive to stay on the platform and do the coaching on your platform and build through your platform. Of course, there's all this billing type of stuff, you know, the escrow and, and, and all that. that. Those are also money transfer, um, electronic fund transfer, and you know, security of, of transactions, all of that are attractiveness, uh, you know, build the attractiveness of a, of a marketplace. So your concerns about attrition um, in a marketplace are valid. All marketplaces have some amount of attrition, but the reason people stay on marketplaces is for the marketing um, reach. And, and as long as you build your platform and design your platform in a way that uh, incentivizes that behavior, you should be fine. Okay. Okay. What are the other big and things is, I might be not be thinking of, or I should be thinking of? Any the other? thing that you're not thinking of at all is, is what is the time of this business? You know, you're going straight to fundraising. What is the time of this business? How big a business can you build? And if you're not building a huge business, then it's not a fundable business. Right. You are trying to build a small business, a small profitable business, and, and by small it could be $10 million, $20 million uh, profitable business. That's not a fundable business. That could be a fantastic business for you, and if you can build that in a bootstrap mode, that's great, but that is not a business that VCs are going to fund. Well, I was looking more for angels than for VCs for that reason. As a matter, angels and VCs more or less operate with the same perspective. Angels are feeders into VCs, by and large. So you don't even, yeah, so you, even if this becomes a business where I am making 10, 20 million, you don't think that that's fundable? 
that's not fundable necessarily, no. Unless, see, VCs want to go and, and think of angels as VCs, as, as basically little VCs who are feeding into the angel and into the VCs. They want to go from zero to 100 million in five to seven years. And if you can't, if you can't deliver a business plan that speaks and assures them that there is a path to doing that with your business, this is not a fundable business. Because even conservatively, it could be a great business. Conservatively, even if I look at acquiring just 2,000 people first year, 4,000 next year, which are very conservative numbers, I was still getting a valuation at about uh, 40 million in five years. But you're saying even that is low? No, I mean, you're thinking valuation. See, startup world doesn't work on valuation. Startup world works on, first, at the, your stage of the journey right now, it works on fundability, whether you're fundable at all or not. And uh, VCs are not looking for, by and large, VCs are not really looking at, you know, a 40 million exit in five to seven years. That's just not of interest to them. There are some, you know, at this point, there are certain funds that I know personally, some of them, who have these, you know, who have identified the fact that not all businesses can scale at that rate and, and are, are doing small-time stuff. So they will put in maybe $250,000 and try to get an exit at about $10 million or $15 million and, and not invest too much money, but try to get an exit at a smaller price. There are There is some experimentation going on that front, but it's few and far between. And the other thing that is true about those kinds of businesses is they tend to be B2B businesses. They tend to not be B2C businesses. So the kind of business you're building will typically not fall in that realm. Okay. okay we'll so your funding. funding strategy will need to be friends and family. And even so, you need to figure out exactly what scale of a business are you talking about. Don't worry about valuation. If you can show me what kind of revenue you're building and if you can validate those assumptions, then I can give you some feedback on, you know, how to, you know, how to get, how to build that business. I can coach you on how to build that business. But as far as fundraising is concerned, there are very, there's very specific reasons and very specific objectives with which people fund businesses. If you're looking at professional investors, not friends and family, friends and family invest in you, professional investors invest in your business. That's the big difference. Right, right. Okay. Okay, so I hope you right. answered, I answered some of your questions. I need to move yes, to the next presenter, Pooja. Thank you so much, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Salma, you're up next, also from New York. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sama and I'm one of the co-founders of Down to Dash. My other co-founder is also Anuja, she's also on the call. Uh, so Down to Dash is a mobile app that connects college students based on what they're down to do, like workouts, sports, eating, traveling, and other activities. Uh, so when my co-founder and I were at university, there were many times we wanted to form a group to play basketball with, but we couldn't find enough people. And there were many times I had to cook alone because my friends were busy and cooking was so much more fun and helpful with friends. So when my co-founder and I did research on this, we saw that 56% of college students feel lonely when they go to college and 40% of foreign students in the U.S. have no close friends on campus. And besides that, there are students who have three groups of friends, but they still find it difficult to find people to do specific activity with. So we created a solution for all of them, a secure platform to meet people in your location to do an activity together. The next slide. Mm -hmm. This is how the app works. So you sign up with your .edu email. So it's a secure student only network, no creeps, no random accounts. You select what you're down to do and the app shows you students in your location who are down for the same. You can also post a specific plan on your profile, for example, eat on this day at this time at Taste of Aloha. You can also post events on the app, clubs, fraternities, sororities can also post events. And by signing up for the app, you not only can post events on the app, but students also get free access to all Down to Dash events. 
and currently mm -hmm. we do down to dash entrepreneurship workshops to foster student entrepreneurship the yeah, next slide our current market size is the 20.5 million students in the us with a focus on the 2.1 million freshmen and in the short term we we'll also expand to the U uk and australian market so our key marketing growth strategy is to partner with orientation teams at different universities and greek life in order to exponentially scale our database our key attraction strategy has been creating and motivating a group of campus ambassadors so we have totally 75 campus ambassadors at different universities and it's these campus ambassadors who are also a group of influencers they're the most excited to use the app and um by making them post plans on the app regularly we double user engagement in the month of may uh, besides that our engagement strategy also revolves around having down to dash entrepreneurship workshops uh, in which uh, students come for the workshops we spend absolutely no cost to host them and they come they have to sign up for the app to enter so that's established a new group of influencers and that has really helped in maximizing word of mouth and um, user engagement so we plan to do a lot more of this in the future along with a digital marketing and pr uh, so we launched the app um, we had a test launch in october last year but we launched the app in march and between march april and may we assembled a team of 75 campus ambassadors we have 2000 plus downloads but more importantly we partnered with nyu and vcu for down to dash to be incorporated as an orientation tool for freshmen this year in uh, when college reopens we also have partnered with fuel collective to host the event at absolutely no cost we were selected for the elevaco accelerator program and are top 3 companies in the program we were selected for the forbes young entrepreneurs council and we got an article for down to dash in forbes which also led to a few other articles and we are selected for the we work labs incubator program in mid may we also launched our advertising partner packages 10 50 and 100 dollar packages and we have six advertising partners who signed up for our 10 and 50 dollar packages yeah how many campuses are these 75 campus ambassadors in 75 different campuses or are we talking about overlap yeah 50 approximately 50, 50. so yeah so primarily we're focusing on new york because it's a location based app but we also do have some in la and some in um, other locations and the 2000 plus downloads what is the distribution of that uh primarily half of them are from new york and like a few no i'm LA talking about campus so if you're talking my guess is this is going to be campus to campus you know concentration of usage is going to be within the campus and not outside the campus so if you're talking about that's the NYU campus how many users do you have how many downloads do you have in NYU because you need a critical mass of users in each campus for this to start rolling so actually how the app works is you can connect with any student around you location based so if i'm in NYU i can connect with a columbia student or if i can i can connect with a marist college student or pace university student but our maximum users so far are from uh, liberty college NYU NYIT and Berkeley these are the four colleges where we have maximum users and um your business model is advertising uh, so we have three advertising package, packages that we've launched 10 50 and 100 because we're new we do a lot more than just a sponsored post on the app we also do social media posts two of our interns work with them personally in order to make do promotions at their university they get to be a speaker and get a table at our event so these are three packages that we've launched but in the future we will also launch a dgd premium account for just 3 dollars a month for users which is optional obviously and we will also um, sell data to marketers okay So I will ask, answer first your second question. What are the most important parts of the pitch I should spend maximum time on? See, right now it's not clear to me that this is a fundable business because advertising supported businesses don't scale very well unless you can rapidly scale to millions of users. And um, so, so the question that I would, 
if I'm role playing with you as an investor, the question that comes to my mind first and foremost is how does this scale and how fast can it scale? And secondly, how do you acquire these advertisers? If you have to you know, talk to and, and do high touch customer service on $10, $50 customers, this is not a scalable business at all. So it's, you know, on all those fronts, I'm totally unconvinced that this business is fundable. So the first answer to your question is that you shouldn't go talk to VCs right now because you're going to be rejected. What is the best way to get an introduction to a VC? You need somebody who is going to introduce you, somebody or some set of people who in your network who is going to introduce you to investors in one million, if you're a part of the one million by one million premium program, that is something we offer. However, you have to be fundable. You have to convince us first that you are fundable before we're gonna make those introductions. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, so actually, uh, what you said about the advertising pack packages, it's just that we're doing these three packages right now because we're new, but in the future, the entire process is gonna be automated like Facebook ads. It has to be, otherwise there's, yeah. this is not a scalable process, absolutely. But you're gonna yeah, have so to model about, everything, like, you know, you have to model what kind of, if I saw somewhere you said you have a 50 cents per user customer acquisition cost, well then how much are you going to, what is each user going to amount to from advertising, you know, our, our poo or, you know, what kind of, what, how much advertising dollar can each customer then generate? What is the ROI on that 50 cents customer acquisition? What is the customer lifetime value? All these things I would need to understand if I want to consider investing in this business and none of that is in your presentation currently. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we generally come to it in Q&A, so do you think it would be like a good idea to add these details in the presentation too? If you want an investor pitch, those are the requirements of an investor pitch. And if you, if you want to have a serious conversation with an investor, all that needs to be in it. Okay. So if you, you know, if you're looking for help with all this, we can help you. So if you hang out, I will explain to you how to use the 1M1M program next, and then you can ask more questions after uh, after I'm done with that segment of the presentation. Yes, definitely. Okay, so folks, uh, if you like what we're doing here in 1 million by 1 million, please refer serious entrepreneurs into the program. We want to work with serious entrepreneurs who understand that building a business is a, is a pretty long-term process. It takes a while to build a business and it's a you know, lot of heavy lifting and a lot of, actually a lot of bootstrapping before people become fundable and that's just the reality of this game. In terms of resources, you'll find everything at 1mby1m.com. You'll find a blog that is immensely uh, rich, uh, both inspiration, education, information, everything. Point of view, it's a very rich blog and it's free. So if you follow the blog, you'll learn a lot from entrepreneurs who are featured in the blog. And then we have the Entrepreneur Journeys book series, which is a series of 12 books that double click down on each topic that we have listed here. And uh, these are um, case study based books. Each case study is, I mean, each book is 12 to 16 case studies where we deal with a particular topic through the journeys of entrepreneurs. That's why it's called entrepreneur journeys, and it simulates the experience of your sitting down with an entrepreneur and having a conversation about how they did it, how they put one foot before the other. That is the philosophy of the one in one in program in general, is learning from people who have done it before we've had over 750 successful entrepreneurs participate in that case study program who have generously offered their insights and their details and strategies and tactics of how they've put one foot before the other and you get to learn from them. These roundtables are a resource that is available on a weekly basis. Um, you can come to as many as you want. You can listen to as many recordings as you want. They are free. The premium program is our full acceleration program and it is a thousand dollar annual membership fee based program that covers extensive methodology guidance, uh, a a full curriculum, online curriculum that you use 
to learn methodology at your own time. And then you can use private roundtables, which we have for the premium members, to actually get project-based coaching. We also help you with business development. We have a tremendous network and we connect you to people that you may find useful to connect to. And we also help you with financing, but you have to become fundable to access those introductions. We again have a very large network of investors, but we will introduce you only if you, we consider you to be fundable. And that is, you know, based on extensive experience in, you know, analyzing businesses and developing pitches that investors consider fundable. Finally, we have a huge clout in the media, so we can help get your word out there based on what you're doing and, you know, get attention from the media and analysts so that you can add your customer base, potential investors, everything, so that you can become visible. Visibility is incredibly important. There is the 1M1M self-assessment. It's a series of questions. It's available for free on the blog. I encourage you all to put yourself through this set of questions. These are the questions investors will ask you. And you need to be able to answer these questions. So you are the first and the most important investor in your company. Go ask yourself these questions about your business and see how well you can answer them. If you get stuck on methodology issues, like how do I do this? You're asking this question, but I don't really understand what this question means and how I come up with the answer to this question, go get 1M1M Basic. And that's a curriculum only option where you can learn methodology that will help you answer those questions. And that's a $99 a month, very inexpensive way to train yourself rapidly and in a very accelerated pace, very efficient, very accelerated pace. And it will help you move through your entrepreneurial journey really rapidly in a very efficient manner. Um, you can go to the website and dig around. There's tons of information, what to expect from premium, what to expect from basic, what to expect from the program in general, lots of FAQs, video FAQs, etc. See if this program is for you. It may be for you, it may not be for you. It is, uh, you know, there's a lot of self-learning involved in how we have designed this program. You have to invest time to learn. And, um, you know, even though the world has this fallacy, this myth that entrepreneurship equals financing, our belief is entrepreneurship equals customers' revenues and profits. And to get there, learning and education is more important than financing. Um, if you understand how to put one foot before the other, you will get to a successful scenario much more with a much higher probability you know level than you would without learning and by making all the mistakes that millions of entrepreneurs before you have made and have died in the process by no means is 1 million by 1 million the only way you can learn entrepreneurship there are many other ways but this is an efficient way. It is a proven way how many entrepreneurs are learning entrepreneurship and are succeeding in accelerating their journey. So it is an option, and you have to decide whether this is the option for you or not. We emphasize greatly on case studies. These successful entrepreneurs that we've been working with every year, we bring on about 100 new entrepreneurs into this case study program, and we've accumulated over 750 of these at this point of over 50 unicorn entrepreneurs, about 400 venture funded companies, 300 plus bootstrap success stories. We have really given you a very comprehensive set of strategies and uh, methodologies with which we know people have succeeded and you can just copy their strategies. In a lot of cases, we will be able to point you to whose strategies you should be looking at copying. And that's very effective, you know. Like earlier in the program, you saw me direct Ali to a particular entrepreneur and a particular successful case study called Magush. And that business is a, almost a direct replica of Ali's business with some nuances. 
that will be different. But there's so much that Ali can learn by modeling his business after Magush. It's amazing. And the truth is right now, we have a lot of scenarios where you will find that dynamic, where somebody has done something, which if you replicate, you will be able to achieve what you're trying to achieve. And that's incredibly valuable. Our methodology is lean capital efficient bootstrap startups. Even if you want to raise funding, you're gonna to have to bootstrap first to validation. And in some cases, especially in B2C businesses, to some level of traction before investors will invest. That's pretty much it. We have roundtables throughout August. We have four free roundtables in August, so we have, we'll have a lot of opportunities to work with you before the summer is over. And we have time for Q&A as well, so you can call in using the instructions on your screen or use the public chat for questions as well, and I will pick up questions from either uh, channel. While you're asking your questions, let me introduce you to Irina Patterson who will be happy to answer any questions you have about the 1M 1M program, you can contact her at irina at 1mby1m.com. Partha Kundu is making an observation. We do see some successful startups in India that is essentially a marketplace but does have mailers and online content, the free educative content that helps get customers interested and glued on. So Partha, you're making a very accurate observation. Content marketing today is one of the best ways to engage um, potential customers and prospects. So yes, and if you, I'm sure you have come to 1 million by 1 million through that uh, method as well. We have a tremendous amount of invaluable content out there, which is how you and many others discover 1 million by 1 million, and then the premium program or the basic program are the business part of our offering, but 1 million by 1 million does exactly the same thing as you're pointing out about those startups that you're mentioning. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Yes, no, nobody has any questions? All right, well, we're gonna, ah, Tunde Salako, please go ahead, hello. Where are you joining from today, and what is your question? You're most welcome. Joining from Lagos, all right. And your question is? Uh, Rishi Gupta, you're asking, you're saying need to ask some questions, but privately? To do that, you're going to need to be a member of the premium program. That's the only way we answer questions privately. If you have questions about the program itself that you want to ask privately, you can contact uh, Irina Patterson and she'll be happy to talk to you privately about the program. Cindy Salako was just wondering how long, what do you mean, what? Ah. Do you have the same question that you want you want to ask questions privately? Okay, got it. Yeah. So the the format of the program, the premium program, is that you have private roundtables, which are members only, where you ask where you get to work with me on your projects and I will give you questions. I mean I will give you both questions and guidance and strategy guidance. You can also communicate with me via email. And uh, we don't encourage this very much, but some entrepreneurs want really private coaching, and that's something that you can buy in addition to your premium membership one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. And those are $750 per hour. But we don't recommend that. You don't need to do that. You can work with that work within the structure of the um, premium curriculum and the 
private roundtables, and that's usually adequate for entrepreneurs. So all you need to invest is the $1,000 annual membership fee. And if you just want to get started with the curriculum, even the $199 per month basic is also a fine place to start. Try to augment your methodology knowledge as much as possible, as quickly as possible, because a lot of time gets wasted due to, you know, lack of good methodology and just, you know, fussing around with stupid mistakes that many entrepreneurs have made already, and you don't really need to make those mistakes again. Yes, uh, Rishi is asking for Irina's contact, irina at 1mby1m.com. Anybody else? Any other questions? Questions, comments? Issues? All right, we are 9.30 a.m. Pacific time, so this is normally when we finish the sessions. Thank you for being here, and good luck making lots of progress with each of your projects. See you soon next week, and we'll continue working on your businesses. This is a working session. You can come here and work, and we'll try to, you know, help you clarify points, develop strategic, you know, paths forward and so forth. That's why we're here. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming.